Okay, uh, thanks. We definitely want everybody to hear. So, um, so this, um, this is a hearing um, that has uh, been held uh, for the purpose of hearing the uh, request for rate increase by Regents Blue Cross. Um, it is being held by the Insurance Division of the Department of Consumer and Business Services. And we are here to receive information from Regents to hear public testimony and to hear comments from the Oregon State Public Interest Research Group. We um, have a couple things that we want to talk about before the hearing gets started. Um, and one, the, the first thing is that this is a hearing. It's not a public forum. It is not a town hall. So by that I mean that we want the input that we receive from the public to be in the form of testimony. Uh, some of you may have uh, been down to the legislature and know that the way the re legislature receives testimony is that you sign up and you come up to the front and you give your testimony. That's the, uh, that's the procedure we're going to have today. Um, if you'd like to uh, give testimony and haven't already signed up, there are sign-up sheets in the back, so I'd encourage you to do that. Given the number of people who've already signed up, we're going to limit testimony to three minutes. Um, and uh, given that, uh, we understand that people have a lot to say. Um, we are accepting written comments both today um, and electronically and in writing uh, to the insurance division. And I'll go over that timeline uh, in a little bit. Um, the three minutes that we're giving you is not transferable to someone else. In other words, if you, if you don't want to use three minutes, that's fine, but your neighbor doesn't get six minutes. Um, so um, the last thing I want to talk about is that um, we um, all have strong feelings about this issue. Uh, and uh, we have a large group here. A lot of people want to talk. I want to encourage folks to be courteous to each other uh, and to allow people to speak, even if you don't agree with them, um, and to uh, respect your neighbor. Um, it's important that we hear from you and that the folks in the room hear from you. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that, again, is for you to uh, respect the other folks who are testifying today. So um, a couple other things that I wanted to mention. There are uh, folks uh, in, the, um, uh, in the group today, in the audience today, who may have individual issues with insurance companies, maybe health, maybe not. We have some consumer advocates out in the foyer who can assist you with an individual problem. That doesn't mean you can't come up and talk about it um, when you give your testimony. But if you have something that uh, has been a problem and you haven't been getting cooperation from an insurance company, we have advocates uh, in the foyer who can help you with that. Um, so here's how we're going to run the, the hearing tonight. Um, Regents um, is going to make a presentation uh, to justify its requested rate increase. Um, at the table to my left are Teresa Miller, who is the administrator for the Oregon Insurance Division, Sue Cayley, who's the deputy administrator, and David Ball, who's an actuary with the division. They are here to ask questions and to clarify issues that were raised in the documents submitted by Regents and possibly uh, other issues that have been raised, that will be raised uh, in its presentation. The Oregon State Public Interest Research Group, which is known as Osberg, um, will uh, then provide comments uh, on the, uh, the requested rate increase. Um, and uh, they may have some additional questions, on, and they're going to be making a presentation. Then uh, we're going to turn it open to testimony from the public. Um, we uh, have a number of people signed up. And again, we encourage you to sign up if you haven't done so already. We need to limit it to three minutes because there are a lot of people who have signed up. And we expect more people to come uh, as they are getting off of work, which is a reason that we had this hearing late in the afternoon so that folks who are at work could get off of work and still come and testify. Um, and as I said before, you can submit written comments. Um, after the hearing, we're going to continue to collect these comments. Uh, and uh, that comment period will be open through June 15th. Uh, and we're going to scrutinize the rate filing. We're going to listen to the comments, review the written comments. Uh, and then ultimately, the uh, division will make a decision. Um, we have an e-notify service. Uh, and you can sign up in the back of the room for that. Um, we will make sure that if you 
sign up for that service that you will uh, get notified of the decision in the case uh, and an explanation for the decision. Oh, I guess one last thing, if you could silence your cell phones or at least uh, put them on what's called airplane mode. I have no idea what that is, but I'm told, told by the, uh, uh, the uh, video folks that that will solve the problem for you. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the insurance division does. We're not going to take a lot of time on this, um, but we thought it would be helpful. Um, I know a number of you are familiar with the division, uh, and the reason that you're here, of course, is that, be, that we review uh, health insurance rates for small groups and, and individual markets. Uh, the division also makes sure that insurance companies are financially stable and can pay claims. Um, they, uh, the, the folks in the insurance division um, review insurance policies because, as you know, they're very, fairly complex. Um, for health insurance and other types of insurance, we make sure that policies contain the required benefits and they don't exclude items that they, they are required to cover. We also look to see that their pricing is fair based on the benefits that are offered. And as you may know, we also license insurance companies and agents who are now called insurance producers. We, um, we have a, um, a, a helpline uh, that we uh, use to uh, assist consumers. Um, they are uh, available by phone uh, to answer questions, um, and they uh, have been very effective in helping individuals uh, Find, problem, um, uh, find solutions to their problems. And uh, we, um, we have, as I say, we have a, a group of folks out in the foyer who can help you if you wanted to talk to them uh, after the meeting. The, um, the advocates, in addition to uh, working with individuals, also identify violations of the law. Uh, and uh, we have investigators in the insurance division who follow up on those issues. And we have a website, which is really uh, pretty useful. Uh, www.insurance.oregon.gov, and a bunch of our materials in the back have that. So um, rate review. Um, the insurance division approves, as I said, health insurance rates for uh, the small group and individual markets. Um, it covers about 12% of Oregonians, and that 12% is considered uh, the most vulnerable uh, group of uh, insurance, health insurance buyers because they lack the negotiating power of, uh, of large groups. These plans are, are purchased by small employers, uh, employers up to 50 employees, and individual plans purchased by people who are self-employed and don't get uh, insurance through an, an employer. Uh, and there's also the portability market for people who are leaving group coverage and need continuing coverage. The insurance division doesn't have authority to review or approve rates for, for large groups, and that's probably for at least a couple reasons. Um, one is that large employers negotiate rates and benefits directly with companies, and they can, simple, uh, they can simply change companies uh, if they don't get uh, the kind of uh, negotiated deal that they, they'd like. Uh, the second is that there is some concern that a regulation of larger groups um, would encourage these groups to self-insure, uh, and then they would be completely exempt from state insurance regulation, and that would probably not be good for the insurance buying public. So um, I don't know how many folks have looked at our website. Um, we, we have a uh, process uh, for rate review that is on our website. It begins when an insurer submits a request for a new rate. Uh, all the documents an insurance company submits uh, as part of the uh, request uh, for a new rate are public. Uh, there's a, as I say, there's a website to, nega to navigate the rate, uh, the rate system. Um, rate requests can be hundreds of pages, and uh, a lot of it is technical. Um, the division is actually in the process of standardizing and trying to simplify these summaries so that uh, consumers can get online and identify and understand the key components of each filing. Once the uh, entire filing is posted on our website, there's a 30-day public comment period. Uh, and it begins, again, when the, uh, when the posting occurs. You can sign up on our, our website to receive an email when your insurer files a rate request. 
and again, you're able to comment on the filing electronically. And these, these uh, comments are actually posted on our website. Once a filing has been uh, thoroughly reviewed and all the consumer comments are considered, the, the division makes a, a decision and posts the explanation, uh, hopefully in plain language, uh, of why it is uh, approved a particular rate or disapproved a rate. And again, if you sign up uh, for our email notification system, uh, we will let you know uh, when uh, the decision has been made and give you our explanation for that. We also have the authority to hold a public hearing, which is what we're doing tonight. Um, and because of the size of the increase that Regents has requested and the number of people affected, um, we really think it, it was important to hear directly from impacted consumers. So how do we decide uh, a uh, request for a rate increase? Um, under, under Oregon law, there are a number of factors we look at. Uh, first, uh, are the benefits reasonable in relation to the premium charged? This means, is the policy priced correctly? If a company is losing money, it would likely meet this test because it's, it's paying out uh, more in benefits than it is taking in in premiums. But the rates can't be excessive, and it can't, they can't be inadequate or unfairly discriminatory. We view excessive as uh, that the assurance, uh, insurers are actually not gouging the public uh, on the rates. Um, and then fairly discriminatory means that people of similar circumstances uh, need to pay, be able to pay similar rates and that the rate uh, increases should be shared uh, appropriately between different groups of policyholders. And the rates uh, must cover the cost of benefits and the insurance company's cost to op operate without being overpriced. As part of this analysis, the insurance division looks at such factors as recent and future costs of medical care and prescription drugs, the company's history of rate changes, its financial strength, the, the premiums and administrative costs. The division also considers the company's overall profitability investment income, and any surplus. If the company's data does not fully support the increase, the division can ask for more information, approve a lesser increase, or reject the increase com uh, completely. So the, the, the rates themselves are, uh, are made up of three parts. Uh, the cost of medical care, the cost associated with actually running the company, and any profit if it's a for-profit company. The cost of medical care, as uh, I think people know, medical costs uh, have continued to rise, and we do have some information in the back room about that issue. Um, the, um, that issue uh, is, of course, uh, built into the rate increase uh, often, and that's something that we take a hard look at. Um, the division is also allowed to consider the impact of rate increases on con consumers when we review the rates, as I said earlier. Um, and given that the rates are increasing um, for the last few years um, and uh, folks are having a real hard time affording uh, health insurance, we have, have taken a hard look at this when uh, in insurers have asked for rate increases. For example, if a company asks for a rate increase because it's losing money in that light of insurance, but it's profitable overall, the division um, might include a smaller increase than the company needs to cover its costs on that line of insurance uh, to lessen the burden on, on consumers. But the rates still need to be sufficient to cover medical claim costs and some reasonable cost of running the company itself. So again, um, if you haven't signed up to testify and, like, and would like to do that, uh, we really appreciate your comments. Um, if you'd prefer to write down a comment, um, that, that's fine too. We're going to take all of those back to the division and review them, as well as taking comments online. Um, we may not be able to answer every individual comment or question, but tonight's comments, as well as any questions as part of the testimony, um, will certainly be considered and we will try to certainly answer 
those comments that are uh, general in nature and that will help educate um, the insurance buying public. Um, and again, uh, you can receive a notice of the our ultimate decision uh, through our e-notifying service. Um, and this is expected to happen probably late June. Um, and in addition to the consumer advocates in the foyer, um, we have, I think, uh, the Oregon Health Plan. Are they there? I think they are. I think they're out there. Um, and I know Osberg also has a table. Yes. So we've got lots of good information out in the foyer um, at, so that at the end of the meeting you can get some additional information. So, uh, Teresa, anything else that you'd like to add? No, I just uh, would welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming and uh, look forward to hearing all your comments. So I think what we're going to do now is uh, Regents uh, is going to come up and make a presentation uh, to explain its requested rate increase. And then some of our folks from the division will probably be asking some questions. Then we'll turn it over to Osberg. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you, Administrator Miller. I'm Jared Short, and I'm the president for Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon. With me here today is Karin Swinson Moore, our director of actuary for our individual products. We appreciate the opportunity to participate in this very important conversation about the rising cost of care in Oregon. Everybody here in the back? Okay. We'll crank up the sound a little bit. <coughs> Go ahead. I want to start off by saying there is nothing about this rate increase that I feel good about. The reality is that we as Argonians are in a place where families are facing increased cost for food, for gas, and health care all the time when we can least afford it. Despite these pressures, I know this increase to be necessary. It is a result of a broken health care system, one which is fueled by rising consumption. We use a lot of health care. Changing our existing system requires us to redouble our efforts and come together with patients, physicians, hospitals, consumer advocates, and yes, health insurance companies. Today we are here to share our story with openness and honesty. I believe the more the public understands how the business of health insurance works, the greater opportunity we have to fix this system. Our presentation today focuses on our individual members. These are the folks, either by circumstance or choice, that do not get their medical insurance through an employer they buy it on their own through individual policies. These policies cover both individuals and families. They represent about 56,000 Oregonians of Regents' more than 730,000 total members. Foundational to health insurance is the basic principle 
that people come together to help one another. Today we are going to focus on our individual members and the challenges the entire Regents community faces. Today we're here to talk about this requested increase and we plan on covering the following. We're going to focus on the drivers of health care cost. We're going to talk about how they impact our individual members. We're going to close with the areas of focus for the future. Regents is proud to be a local, not-for-profit health care organization based in Oregon. We have been here since 1941, and we expect that to continue. I want to talk about rising health care costs and what that means. It means that prices are increasing. It means that we have medical advancements, that drugs, procedures, and technology are getting better, and that we're able to more effectively treat people when they need care. They also are driven by benefits and benefit changes, the actual products and services that individuals buy. And lastly, they reflect cost shifts from government programs. But let's start by talking about prices. This slide reflects how individual prices in Oregon for our individual members have been going up. And on this slide is the reflection of what we pay hospitals and doctors for the medical bills that our members have. And what you see on this slide is that there's a steady increase each and every year. If you look at this over the past five years, we've actually increased those payments to hospitals and physicians to the tune of $34 million. And what's important to note about that $34 million is this is one of the ways the healthcare system is broken. This is a reflection of us paying for healthcare bills regardless of outcomes. It's the result of paying for how many times we show up somewhere to be treated by our physicians. And it's a key area that we have to talk about change. I want to give some examples. And these are common examples. These are everyday examples. So relative to emergency rooms for our individual members, if we go back over the past five years, the cost to our members for going to an emergency room has gone up by 32%. And that's a reflection of two numbers. The first number is just simply what a hospital charges for an emergency room visit. And that's gone up, as this slide shows, 54% in the past five years. Now, during the same time period, the frequency of our members showing up in the emergency room has gone down by 14%. So the question is that I get commonly, well, is utilization going down? And if so, why are healthcare costs still going up? Because that utilization, the frequency of use, isn't the primary driver. It's actually the prices and the cost that we pay to hospitals and physicians. So even though for the frequency for emergency rooms have gone down for our members, we're paying more for when they do show up. And that's resulted in that 32% increase. Another common example, maternity. The cost per individual members has gone up 40% in the last five years. Very specifically, the payments that we make for births to hospitals and physicians has gone up by 50% in that time period, all while we've seen a decrease in the frequency of births. But again, that decrease in frequency is not enough to make up for that difference. Thus, the 40% overall increase. Outpatient surgery, something else that's very, very common. Again, it's a 32% increase to our members. Now, the cost per case that we pay to physicians and hospitals for that service has gone up by 59% in this same time period. While there's been a decrease in the frequency of use of 17%. I 
wouldn't want to stop with just talking about medical costs. Pharmacy costs are also a part of increasing cost. Singular, a very common pharmacy drug to treat asthma. In our last five years, we've seen the frequency of use for our members go up by 33%. That's a good thing. Our members have better health because they're taking Singular. But as that frequency has gone up by 33%, so has cost. And at the same time, the cost for our members in that same time period for taking that same drug has gone up by almost 19%. Enbrel, rheumatoid arthritis is something many people are afflicted with. The frequency of use since, the, since 2006 has gone up by almost 70% for Enbrel. And the cost per member to cover the cost of that drug has gone up by 113.7% in that same time period. It's rising cost. Cymbalta to treat depression. The frequency of use has gone up by 33% in the last five years. The cost per member for Regents individual members, almost 36% increase for the treatment. These are good medical advances. They help people get better, but they do cost more. And they are costing more. So when I opened, I talked about the cost shift. And when I mean cost shift, very practically what I mean is when a Medicare or Medicaid member walks into a doctor's office or a hospital, the government pays the bill. But the government doesn't pay doctors and hospitals what it actually costs to deliver that service. In fact, they pay about 89 to 91 cents on the dollar for those services delivered, which is below the break-even point for physicians and hospitals, which the slide shows. So who pays the difference? Everyone that buys private insurance to the tune of 128% pays the difference. These are examples of how health care costs go up. But I want to shift gears and I want to talk a little bit about the individual members that we serve, our 56,000 members. Every dot on this slide represents an individual member that Regent serves. And they're spread all across our state. But let's talk about these types of members. It's important to note that in accordance with privacy practices, these members have been de-identified. But I want to start and I want to talk about, let's call her Kathy. And Kathy's a real member, by the way. She's 54 years old. She has heart disease and high blood pressure. And this past year, Kathy paid Regents $3,400 for health insurance. And something tragic happened to Kathy. And the result of that was Regents paid out in medical bills for Kathy $289,000. Let's talk about Michael. Michael's an individual member, and he's 61 years old, and he has skin cancer. This past year, Michael paid Regents $7,370 for health insurance. And you know what Regents did when he got, health, uh, got skin cancer? We paid $407,400 to protect Michael and his family. Talk about Kyle. Kyle's 35 years old, and for all intents and purposes, he's relatively healthy. He had leg pain symptoms this past year. This past year, he paid us $1,850. When he had that leg pain, Regents paid out $200. So guess what? Kyle paid Regents more money than he consumed in health care. But that's the principles of health insurance. It's about getting people together. We need a lot of Kyles to help pay for health care. That's how we take care of Kathy and Michael. It's the heart of how health insurance works. 
part of our job at Regents is to project how much we need to collect to make sure we can pay for the Kathy and Michaels of the world. At this point, I would like to transition to Karen Swenson more to talk about why this increase, why 22.1, and how it ties to making sure we can continue to do the things that we do for Kathy and Michael. Thank you, Jared. So we all know we filed for a rate increase for our individual pool of 22.1%. That reflects an average annual rate increase for members who will renew their policy sometime this summer. I'd like to emphasize for the room that this does not include any of our Medicare members. This is strictly our individual members who are not el eligible for Medicare. I'd also like to emphasize that the people receiving this increase will have had the same rates since a year ago, since last summer. So they've not received a rate increase for a year. On average, this 22.1% is an average dollar increase of $37 per person per month. That also will vary depending on the person, depending on which plan they're enrolled in and the, their age. These rates will be good for these members for 12 months after they receive the rate increase. When we break down the annual average rate increase, you can see it on the slide that it's 14.8% due to increases in cost of care. 6.5% due to new benefits, and 0.8% for regents to operate our individual business and maintain our reserves. In dollars, on average, that equals $25 per person per month for the cost of care increases, $11 for new benefits, and $1 for administration. When we talk about cost of care, Jared already has talked about some of the drivers, but basically it means how much we believe it will cost to cover health care services for our Oregon individual members for the future. It includes our expectation of how many services those members will use and how much those services will cost. The biggest driver of the cost of care increase is our provider reimbursement, how much we will pay to doctors, hospitals, and pharmacies to care for our members. That also includes the government cost shifting that Jared just mentioned. When we negotiate with our providers, we have to consider that, and they certainly consider that when they're negotiating with us. It also includes, again, how many more services we expect our members to be using, and the mix of those services. A good, really good example of that is what Jared just mentioned regarding Embro. It used to be that members with rheumatoid arthritis suffered a lot and didn't have a lot of good options for treating those symptoms. Drugs like Enbro have allowed them to have a much higher quality of life, but there is a cost to the system and for insurance as a result of that. They're getting a great benefit from that, but there is a cost in the system as a result of that. Moving on, there is a portion of this rate increase that is related to new benefits, and those new benefits are as a result of the new requirements from federal health care reform. In fact, the members who will receive this rate increase have already received some additional benefits that were not built into the rates that we charged them last, as of last summer. And there will be some additional benefit changes with this renewal. Some of the rate changes include the fact that they no longer have any lifetime limits on the benefits they receive. That means no matter how many benefits they use, no matter how long they've been with us, they will always have benefits through Regents, as long as they keep paying premiums. Another great benefit for members is that now we're going to be covering preventive care at 100%. That was not part of our plans before, and there is a cost associated with that. That is a good thing. We're very happy to do it, but it is, there is a cost associated with that. And finally, some other limits have been removed. We had some annual dollar limits on various types of benefits, and those are long, no longer there. So the cost of care, the benefits will go up. Finally, 
we do have 0.8% or $1 of our rate increase is related to supporting the cost of administering our programs, including the usual things like paying claims, answering the phones when customers have questions, offering disease management programs and wellness programs, and paying taxes, paying our fees such as the <coughs> Oregon Medical Insurance Pool Assessments, and at the end of the day, making a small contribution to the reserves to maintain our financial stability for regions. So over the past three weeks, folks have been asking me, is this increase really necessary? I think the simple answer is yes. Over the past five years, Regents has paid out just under $100 million more in medical bills for our individual members in comparison to the money we're actually collecting from them. And you know what? We're not asking for one penny of that back. That's what we believe we're here for. What we are asking is that we're allowed to make this adjustment in premiums that allows us to cover the bills of our individual members going forward. Being a not-for-profit is something we're proud to be. I recognize that this increase is significant for our members. It impacts my own family. But we do have a track record that's proven that we manage our organization at Regents as a not-for-profit in this community to 0% profits over the past 10 years. Now certainly in some years we have gains, in some years we have losses, as this slide reflects. But over the 10 years, which is really core to our mission, is to be close to zero. Even with this level of cost stewardship, costs continue to climb. And as they climb, I do believe we can make it better. But it's going to take the entire community. It's going to require that we change the pure economics of health care that's built on a system to not be reimbursing of hospitals and providers based on how many times I show up in their office, but on if I become more healthy and if my symptoms get better. And Regents is committed to that work, and we're committed to partnering with hospitals and physicians to do that necessary work. We also have to make sure that we're encouraging cost transparency, that we actually know what the cost of services are. I would venture to say that our individual members and many people here today don't know that embryo has gone up over 100% over the past five years. I think we know that it helps us. We also have to make sure that we're getting effective treatments. There is such a thing as getting the right care at the right place in the right time. And when we look at our emergency room visits for our individual members, we do see improvements. We do see less unnecessary usage of emergency room visits. But that's not enough to make up for the cost increases of what we pay for that emergency room care. And lastly, we can't forget to promote health and wellness, something Regents has been doing very, very aggressively since 2003. If you look at the health of our state and the health of our nation, since 1977, we have progressively become sicker and sicker. And as we've done so, we've had the best medical advancements in the world that's helped us to deal with that. But it costs money to do that. Reversing the tide by focusing on health is a long-term solution that we're committed to and that we're going to continue to focus on for the benefit of our members. We do have hope.
There are no easy answers to the problems we've been discussing today. We aren't just talking about dollars. I get it. We're talking about members' lives. This increase is necessary for us to meet our promise to pay our members' medical bills. People like Kathy and Michael. But we also have a commitment to our other 700 plus thousand Regents members that we'll be there for them too in their time of need. People like Kathy and Michael are depending on us. They're depending on us in their time of need. And I appreciate this opportunity today to share what the cost drivers are of healthcare and how Regents' commitment is here to be here and to make sure that we keep that promise. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. So we're gonna have uh, folks from the division um, have an opportunity to ask um, Regents some questions. As you can probably see from the agenda, if you pick one up, we are, we are past where we should be. Uh, anybody who's signed up to testify, don't worry. We're just going to extend the time until you have an opportunity to testify. Um, so, uh, Teresa and the folks up at the, at the panel, go ahead, go ahead and, and, and ask some questions. Okay, thanks. Thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, one of the main reasons that we're holding this hearing today is really because this 22.1% increase is significantly higher than rate increases currently being requested by um, your competitors. Consumers covered by other insurers are not using as much medical care as those companies had predicted, and I think you've also indicated that your members are also using less care. So why is this requested increase so much higher than those increases that we're seeing by your competitors today? The first thing I would say is percentages can be misleading. Percentages have a lot to do with what the base premium being talked about is. Quite simply, if you look at this increase and you look at Regents' premiums in the marketplace, what I want to make sure that we point out is we do have competitive products and services today. We have premiums for our individual members that are the lowest in the market for some products and services. And others, yes, they may be higher. But on the, t on the totality of that, we do have competitive premiums. This increase reflects the difference between what we expect to pay out in medical bills for our individual members and what we need to collect in terms of money to pay for it. This rate request includes a provision for a 1.1% profit or what we call a contribution to surplus. Last fall, you transferred $56 million in surplus to your holding company. And so given that transfer, um, why do you think now you need a contribution to surplus as part of this rate filing? I don't believe, I would disagree, that the moving of the $56 million is tied to this rate increase. Very specifically, our reserves, which is what we're talking about, which on average is $1,000 per member a month. That's roughly one emergency room visit for every member, one time. That's roughly one MRI for every member, one time. And our reserves are for the purpose of paying claims for our members and investing in their health. Investing in services like pharmacy. Certainly, no one could disagree that the rising cost of pharmacy isn't a problem. But it takes investment to improve that to improve the health and wellness, the, the actual consumption of health care for things like diabetes since 1994 in Oregon that have significantly gone up, as well as the cost to treat it, takes investment to improve members' health. So I want to be very, very clear about the money you're referencing. That money is for the benefit of Regents members. Regents has seen a steady decline in enrollment as rates have increased um, since 2008. I'm really interested to understand why you don't believe that enrollment would continue to drop with this rate increase. I would first point out that I believe the individual market in totality is decreasing in Oregon, not just Regents. And that is a significant concern that we have. When we project the health care cost, for individual members, for our individual members, 
One of the things we want to make really, really sure is that if it's 59,000 members, we're collecting enough money to pay for 59,000 members. At the same time, I recognize that enrollment in Oregon, people buying individual policies is going down, but they're going down for multiple reasons. They're going down because people are joining the employer market and buying employer coverage. It's going down because they decide to go out and move to a new carrier because Oregon is a very, very competitive market. We have seven really strong domestic carriers. And yes, a third reason that is very troubling is that members do leave Regents because the cost of insurance is unaffordable. I'm not suggesting that we won't face potentially further decline, but I don't think we can predict all the future and what those three decisions our individual members will make. And if we pick wrong and we don't cover all those costs, who's to pay? Affordability is one of the primary concerns expressed by consumers regarding this rate increase, and frankly, not just this increase, but most increases we see. What is Regents doing to address this really important issue? First, I want to say that I, too, am very concerned about rate increases, as are all the employees at Regents. And every day, our employees focus on what we can do to make that better. And so we're focusing on multiple initiatives. Number one, we focus on transparency. We focus on educating our members. We have 600,000 Regents members that come to MyRegents.com to seek advice on navigating this very difficult healthcare system. They research what the cost of hip replacements are, what the cost to treat diabetes are, what the cost of MRIs are, and that's all done through the internet. But we go beyond that. We have a customer service team that I'm very proud of, that when our members call in to ask a question about their deductible, they don't just tell them what their deductible is. They try to seek and understand why they're asking. An example I just heard this last month that I am very proud of, and we do this every day, is a member calling in because, yes, they have a deductible and they need to have an MRI done for knee damage. And that member's talking about their deductible and not being able to afford it. And what our customer service person did was kept that member on the line and they called the physician of that member to share the concerns and ask them, do you mind if we ask what the price of this service is? And you know what we found out? It was around $1,500. And that member couldn't pay $1,500. So we asked the physician on the phone in real time, would you mind if we helped our member shop around for a price that they might be more affordable for them? And the physician said yes. So we, you know what we did? We called two and three other centers that conduct MRIs. You know what? To the end of that conversation, that member was able to get the same MRI get it to their physician for their care for around $700. There's immediate savings for our members and for all Regents members when we do that. And frankly, as an entire industry, we need to go more on that direction. Another example has to do with how we assist and partner with our members and our physicians when somebody has a chronic condition, diabetes, asthma, coronary artery disease. They're all significant costs. We partnered with a clinic and actually piloted a program that gets referenced as a medical home, and that's a topic that gets talked about a lot today in healthcare reform. And you know what that resulted in for our members that were in that program? Their primary care cost went up substantially, and we thought that was a good thing because they were coordinating care. And at the same time, what happened in the following 18 months is that their inpatient how many times they showed up in the hospital went down, and overall there were savings of almost 18%. So as leaders in healthcare in Oregon, we've taken that out as an industry in partnership with other carriers and hospitals and physicians to 14 clinics where we are reimbursing nurses to help coordinate that same level of care for patients in their physician's offices that have asthma, 
coronary artery disease, hypertension, et cetera. And we're enhancing the preventive benefits that go with that. As Karin talked about in this individual pool, so that they can seek that preventive care with the hope that we won't have as much high cost delivery in those expensive ER settings. That's another example of where we're focusing. We continue to focus on our pharmacy programs. Our pharmacy program has some of the strongest generic utilization of prescription drugs in the country. And we're really proud of that. And we continue to provide that education to our members and to physicians to encourage the use where appropriate. We're also working with key delivery systems on changing how we pay for the economics of health care to not change or not pay for care based on how many times we show up in their doctor's office, but instead, did we get better? We have to recognize that's changing a system that's been consistent since 1941. That doesn't change easily, but we're very, very committed to it. I could list more examples, but... Can I ask you a specific question about that piece? Because I, I, I've seen reference to that. Do you have an, any idea the percentage of providers that fall into that category in terms of changing that structure of payment? I want to make sure I understand your question. So um, if we look at the number of physicians in Oregon, are you asking how many are committed I know to that changing? Oh. I know that you started reimbursing providers differently, so rather than being based on um, quantity of services, um, more of an um, outcome-based um, payment. So my question is just in terms of the providers that you contract with, are all of your providers in, in that category, or is there a percentage of providers in that category? No, and, and um, I think to clearly answer the question, what I would tell you is no, not all providers, and actually no, not the majority of providers are in that type of a program. What we know about our cost is that 15%, actually 15% of our individual members, our 59,000 members, drive just over 80% of the total health care cost. What we're actually doing when I talk about in this early stage, what I would call physician hospital reimbursement changes and reform, is we're focusing on those that consume the highest levels of cost, and we're paying differently for that. I do expect very quickly past that and at the completion of that work that, yes, we have to begin doing the same thing for all other Regents members, but it's not going to happen overnight. Do you have any estimates at this point about how much that will save moving to this new structure of reimbursement? The short answer in front of me would be no. Okay. But what I would tell you is I can, I can certainly reflect on what it's addressing. It's addressing the $34 million that I underscored earlier. So <coughs> this slide, this is what we pay hospitals and physicians. So if we're successful at doing this, and by the way, we can't do it by ourselves. It does take partnerships with hospitals, doctors, employers, and all of our 700 plus thousand members. But if we're successful at it over time, $34 million certainly will be a lower number going forward. As you can imagine, we've gotten a number of comments uh, from the public, uh, more so than I think on any other filing. Uh, and it's not unusual for us to hear from medical providers who submit comments um, about the proposed increase. And many of these providers are questioning the validity of statements about the increasing cost of health care um, because they're not seeing their reimbursement rates um, go up at the same level of these increases. So can you address that? It's a great question. <clears throat> and one thing I want to be very careful is as, as we increase this 34 million dollar number over the past five years. It is going absolutely to doctors and hospitals, but that doesn't mean it's going in people's pockets. If you look at the expansion in our state with health care in this same past five year period, we have new very expensive facilities in Portland. We have them in Southern Oregon. We have them in Eugene. We have them 
in Salem, that takes money. When we have subsidies around Medicare and Medicaid, that's not where the money's coming from. It's coming from the private insurance markets. So um, when I talk about $34 million going up, it also goes for an awful lot of brick and mortar. How are we doing on time? I have, I have a few more if we've got time. Your time. Um, previously, in, in prior rate funds, you adjusted the rate factor for children um, ages 0 to 24 in response to the federal requirement um, to provide guarantee issue coverage to children uh, under 19. Now that insurers will be able to shift the risk for covering these children to the Oregon Medical Insurance Pool under our children's uh, reinsurance program that, that we're working on right now and should have in place in August, will the company be proposing to reduce um, the amount of charges for these kids? I have been thinking about that because that has been a current topic. And the answer is we have not evaluated it yet, but I think it is definitely something we will consider. Consumers also allege uh, that corporate greed is driving the rate increase and point to high CEO salaries um, and failure to cut corporate costs as contributing factors. So tell us what the company has done to control costs and how any savings um, have been shared with members. So I think the underpinning of this question really deals with the rising cost of care and what is driving the, the cost of care. Okay. And very specifically, the two pieces I'll tell you is relative to salaries, if we reduce the top 12 leader salaries within Regents, it would not reduce premiums that we're talking about by any more than one-tenth of one penny. So clearly, salaries aren't the drivers of rising cost of care. But more specifically to your question, because I do think it's appropriate to answer in the past several years what Regents has done, number one, we froze employee wages. Number two, we rolled back management salaries. Number three, we stopped offering our defined benefits pension plan and moved to only defined contribution, something that's certainly a topic in today's environment. And we have over a thousand employees less today than 18 months ago when I joined Regents. So I do believe we've been sensitive to an economy that has slowed down, and we have not been immune to it. And we have also made difficult decisions. We've also increased the cost share for our own benefits with our employees, with employees paying as much as 60% of the cost for family coverage. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Th thanks a lot. Um, Thank you for having me. So. Um,